Hi, this is Remembering the Past, the show where we talk about people who died recently who've had a profound effect on our history, our society, or our culture. Tonight we're going to start out with Charles Aznavour, who died recently at the age of 94. Huge French singing star, actually he was Armenian, he was the cousin of Mike Connors, whose podcast we've done, by the way. As I said, he was a huge star in France in the 1940s and 1950s. He was a singer and a songwriter. And in the 1960s, he set out to conquer the United States, and he did pretty well here, too. He would sing on television a lot. I remember on the Danny Kaye show all the time, also on Mike Douglas. He went into the movies. He sold out Carnegie Hall in a concert in 1964. 1967, he sold out the Royal Albert Hall for a concert, and he was huge in Japan as well. A lot of people call him the Frank Sinatra of France. But in many respects, he was more versatile than Sinatra, especially as a songwriter, and he was probably more popular worldwide. Here is French-English television on Charles Aznavour, including his star on the Hollywood Walk of Fame and his legacy. Only a handful of French stars have made it to the Hollywood Walk of Fame. Charles Aznavour was one of them. In the US, he was known as the French Sinatra. But people flocked to see him perform all over the world. His international career started with wanting to conquer America. In the 1950s, he was already a big star in France, but he wanted more. By the 60s, he was touring the state's legendary music venues and building up a repertoire singing in English. When I was young, the taste of life was sweet as you have to start again. It's hard for someone who's used to being welcomed on stage with open arms, then not to be recognized at all. You have to start from square one, song by song. It was an American love story that would last more than 50 years. During his international career, he sang with some of the biggest stars, like Liza Minnelli. First, he conquered America, and then the world. As Navarre performed in over 90 different countries, in numerous languages. At the age of 94, he was still touring. He just returned from performing in Japan and was due to go to Armenia in a few days' time. He leaves a global legacy that won't be forgotten. Music critic Marcel Harrison Press joins me here in the studio. A true music legend, uh, not just here in France, but uh, but also abroad. He really was uh, the ambassador of La Chanson Française. Uh, he was popular around the globe, and even today, uh, for example, he was still massive in Japan, uh, where he was on tour as recently as last month. Uh, but back in the day, it was stars such as Ray Charles and Fred Astaire uh, who covered his songs. So he was a real icon on a similar level to that of uh, Edith Piaf, for example, and he was even named Entertainer of the Century by CNN back in 1998. But to break it down for you, Nadia, um, his career spanned more than seven decades, okay? Seven decades. During that time, he composed 1,400 songs, sang in eight different languages, okay? He sold 180 million records. Uh, he was also an actor. He appeared in some 60 films. So it just gives you an idea of how big his career was. Now, for English-speaking uh, audiences, he was probably best known uh, for the song uh, She. Uh, I don't know if you know it. She may be the face I can't forget, a trace of pleasure or regret. Notting Hill? Am I right? Yes, yes, yes. it was in Notting Hill, do you remember? And it was Elvis Costello who did that, who covered the song. Um, but that was actually a Charles Aznavour song. Um, so a beautiful song. Um, very well known to English-speaking audiences, but in French, uh, his most famous song was the 1965 track La Boheme. I'm going to take a listen now. La Nous 
So La Boheme, one of uh, Charles Aznavour's biggest hits. Uh, there were so many. You can't see an American actor singing on TV. Here's Charles Aznavour singing She. She may be the face I can't forget A trace of pleasure or regret Maybe my treasure or the price I have to pay she may be the song that soul sings, maybe the chill that autumn brings, maybe a hundred different things within the measure of a day. None of the obits mention it, but Charles Asmawar has a Mickey Mantle connection. And when it comes to the Mick, we're going to mention it. Probably Charles Asmawar's most famous song in America wasn't she. It was yesterday when I was young. The best version of that song was done in the United States by my man Roy Clark. In fact, a lot of people think it's a country song. When Mickey found out he was dying, he said, I want you to call my buddy Roy Clark, and I want him to sing Yesterday When I Was Young at my funeral. Sure enough, after Bob Costas' stirring eulogy, Roy Clark did a moving version of Charles Aznavour's Yesterday When I Was Young. I just hope God has a place for him where he can run again where he can play practical jokes on his teammates and smile, that boyish smile. Because God knows no one's perfect. God knows there's something special about heroes. So long, Nick. Thanks. A moving, moving eulogy by Mickey Mantle's friend, Bob Costas. And now here is Roy Clark with the Great song that song Mickey song. wanted to hear yesterday I while I was young. There are so many songs in me. That won't be sung. I feel the bitter taste of tears upon my tongue. The time has come for me to pay for yesterday when I was young. Doesn't get much better than that. We're going to move on now to Jeff Emmerich, who died recently at the age of 72. When Jeff Emmerich was a little boy, he wanted to be a sound engineer, and when he was in high school, his career officer got him an interview at EMI Records in St. John's Woods, where he worked at Abbey Road. One thing led to another, and after doing a nice session for Manfred Mann on Pretty Flamingo in 1966, when he was 20 years old, he became the sound engineer for the Beatles. Much of the sound recording on albums such as Revolver and Sgt. Pepper is his, so he's one of the unsung heroes of the Beatles story of the mid-60s. Now, I could play a bunch of songs that he worked on for the Beatles, but the licensors would probably make me cut him. So rather than that, I'm going to have him tell you the story of how he came to work for the Beatles. I was then promoted after Norman Smith, the original engineer of the Beatles left to become a producer and Norman was doing bands like Manfred Mann and various other bands at EMI uh, and it was Martin's bands. I took over Norman's sessions so the first recording I did was for, for Manfred Mann and it was Pretty Flamingo which went straight to number one. Anyway five months later I was called up to the manager's office and George Martin was up there because I used to do a lot of George Martin sessions because we had the, we had the same sort of sense of humour so we sort of you know gone well because of that. We used to see the funny side of the most sort of miserable sort of situations. So anyway, I was called up to his office and he, George, the manager said, George has got something to ask you. And he said, do you want to do the Beatles? And then I sort of played this little, my, my heart sort of sank, obviously. And I was playing this little mind game. The little red ball was going on from yes to no, yes to no, yes to no, yes to no. And it stopped on yes. And I thought, well, I've got nothing to lose, you know. So I said yes. And he said, well, in two weeks' time, we're going to start the new album, which was Revolver. Well, it wasn't titled Revolver then, but it was to become Revolver. And the first track we started to cut was Tomorrow Never Knows. And that was the working title of that was Mark One. At the time of the session, I think Paul knew that I was going to become their recording engineer. But the others didn't because I had one of the mics open from the studio into the control room. And I think it was George Harrison said, that where's Norman? And I realized then that they did not know that I was going to take over as the engineer. So that made me feel even worse. When we started to do the, 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 the record, um, John wanted his voice to sound like the Dalai Lama singing from a mountaintop 25 miles away from the studio. You know, all we've got in our control room is two stereo machines, an eight-input mixing console. With, with limited equalization and an echo chamber. So I'm sort of stuck and panicking inside. And as luck had it, I was looking through the control room window and there was the revolving speaker, which was the Leslie speaker from the Hammond organ. 
And I thought, well, if we could get into the circuitry of that and put John's voice through that, that might give John you know, what he wants. So we did that, and of course it won John over. He thought it was absolutely fantastic. And we sort of saved that sound for the last verse of the record. And the next thing was Ringo was getting fed up with these sort of there was a protocol at EMI, the way you recorded drums and so forth. So he wanted a different drum sound. And I was aware of different drum sounds because of listening to the American records. So I decided to, to start to close mic the drums, put the mics closer to the drum kit. And then the idea was, was on the bass drum to take the front skin off and then stuff a, a big sweater inside it and put the front skin back on and move the microphone closer to the bass drum. And I got in trouble for that because... The rulings there were the fact you weren't supposed to put the bass drum mic closer than 18 inches to the bass drum. And I took it about four inches away from the front and someone sort of snitched on me. And so the next day I was in trouble uh, and there was a sort of meeting with management. In fact, in the end, I got a letter giving me permission to be able to do that on Beatles sessions. So of course, as time went by, everyone wanted to, and I put all the drums as a mono drum set because we would, all the Beatles stuff up until Abbey Road was monitored in mono through one loudspeaker. It was never de designed for stereo, um, not at all. So that became the accepted way to do bass drums and everyone else wanted to do bass drums in, 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 that, in, that, in that fashion. So you can see that the Beatles were not just recording artists or celebrities, but they were sound pioneers. And Jeff Emmerich was one of the key people involved in that aspect of their career. Like a lot of other people associated with the Beatles, he wrote his memoirs. And like a lot of other memoirs, a lot of people didn't like it. He made his share of enemies, but he remained friends with Paul. And after the Beatles broke up, Paul used him on a lot of his projects. So most people don't know his name, but millions upon millions of people have heard the sounds that he helped create for the Beatles. Well, I'm going to close on that note. I want to thank my producer and IT genius, Sid Tepps, and we're going to close tonight with Peggy Sue Guerin, who died recently at the age of 78. And I'm going to go out on a limb and say there's probably no more famous song about a particular girl than Peggy Sue. And I know about Nancy with a smiling face, about Nancy Sinatra and Linda, which was about the girl who became Linda McCartney. And the Kinks did a great song about Queen Victoria. But there's no more famous song than Peggy Sue by Buddy Holly in 1957. Peggy Sue Guerin was a high school classmate of Buddy Holly in Lubbock. And she was the girlfriend of his drummer, Jerry Allison. They eventually married. They divorced a little later on. And she said, well, she was always going to marry Buddy Holly. But that's a point of contention that's not really worth talking about here. What's worth talking about is this song. It was one of Buddy Holly's first songs after he came back from Nashville and recorded in Clovis under Norman Petty. And it was originally supposed to be titled Cindy Lou. We're going to close with the story of Peggy Sue by some of the musicians who recorded it with Buddy Holly, followed by that legendary song. And then the follow up, Peggy Sue Got Married, which was good enough to get a movie made out of it. Buddy had a uh, song started called Cindy Lou. I think he had a niece named Cindy Lou or Cindy, but uh, it was sort of like, uh, Cindy, oh, Cindy, Cindy, don't let me down. That uh, Harry Belafonte kind of feel. Cindy Lou, Cindy Lou, oh, how my heart yearns for you, oh, Cindy. Nikki Sullivan says Petty was not impressed. Norman says, well, that cha-cha beat uh, isn't going to work. So you're going to have to do something else. And that's when Buddy said, uh, Jerry, why don't you try paradiddles? It'll give us a 4-4 beat. We'll speed it up a little bit. A paradiddle is a basic practice pattern for a drummer. It involves rapid strokes, which create a rolling sound. Jerry Allison agreed to the modified rhythm and suggested one more change. I had a girlfriend at the time named Peggy Sue, so I talked to him and changed it to Peggy Sue, and then we finished it with a, with a different feel, you know, like a straight eights kind of... Peggy Sue, Peggy Sue, oh, how my heart yearns for you, oh, Peggy, my Peggy Sue, oh, I love you, Kelly, for love you, Peggy Sue, Peggy Sue, Peggy Sue, oh, how my heart yearns for you, oh, Peggy, my Peggy Sue, you recall a girl that's been Song. This is what I heard. Of course, the story could be wrong. She's the one I've been told. Don't you wear a band of gold? Peggy Sue got married not long ago. Oh. Peggy Sue got married not long ago.